I want to start by beginning <clears throat> with prayer that something that the Lord said was that he's going to begin putting his finger on areas of our lives quite clearly. And he's going to do it sovereignly. Sometimes it's going to be in a dream. Sometimes it's going to be at home. It's going to be at work. And he's just going to touch it. He's going to be, do it in a service. He can do it with all of us. But God is basically, basically preparing us for the days ahead. And in doing so, he wants you to flow unhindered by old patterns, old strongholds. And I think he's going to start doing a sovereign work in preparation. And <clears throat> there's some people that will yield to the work of God, and there are people that won't yield to the work of God. But basically, the availability is going to be there. Um, <clears throat> the two words that I think are real important to understand is that God wants us to, this is out of the message, by the way, it's in uh, to soak into the divine reverence for God, to soak in the fear of God, to soak in the fear of God. Therein lies your future. That, that scripture and the message has really stood out this week, and, and it's, it's something that I just think that God wants us to do. So let's give him time to search our heart. He can do it in the service. He can do it at home. He can wake you up in a dream. But in the days ahead, That's Proverbs 3, 17 through 18. 23, Proverbs, 23, Proverbs 23, 17 through 18, in the message. And here's something that I feel like uh, I want to even begin is, is just take the time to soak. We're always so much in a hurry. Why don't we just let it go and just take a moment and just soak in that. Soak in honoring God. Because when I look back when he taught me in the school of the spirit and I says, God, teach me to pray. He basically didn't do anything except that, Dennis, when you close your eyes, you're honoring me. That's not very complicated. But it, it set a precedent and a foundation that's never left. If you honor God, he will honor you. And... It cuts through people pleasing for sure, because just basically your whole life focus then is on I want to honor God, and so Father, we just thank you right now that we even at this moment are soaking into your presence to honor you, and when we drop down, uh, that means we sink into Him as being clothed, and He rises up in us to impact the world, and this is where we're going to kind of go today. So Father. Uh, if you're at home um, and you're watching by Ustream, just close your eyes and sink into his presence. There you go. I'm saying there you go. I'm basically discerning the room. When you sink into him, he rises up in you. And that's where you get the perceptions, the revelations. Is because when you sink into him, he influences your mind. You go down, he goes up. You drop down, he, he rises in your heart. And then out of that abundance of the heart, then the mouth can speak. Because behind your words needs to be the proper nature, and the nature is in the seat of, the, of, of your Bible heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. But I want to approach this from a little different approach here. I believe that there's plenty of false identities that God's going to have to deal with in these days. And <clears throat> these, these false identities have been hindering people for the longest time. And even if you've been a believer for a long time, you've taken a lot of courses and a lot of teaching, there are still too many believers that basically see themselves as stupid, a failure, I don't belong, I'm damaged goods, I'm unlovable, unspiritual. Have you ever heard any of your friends say this? If you haven't, I'm unspiritual, I've disqualified, and these are basically dysfunctional identities that you've taken upon yourself. Now, there's the verse of Scripture in the message. Do not for a minute envy the careless rebels. Soak yourself in the fear of God. That's where your future lies. Soak yourself in the fear of God. That's where your future lies. Because the minute... The minute you're not soaking in who he says you are, you are a derivative life. You know what I mean by a derivative life? You're not your own. You didn't make you. You're not a product of your mother and father. For that matter, you're a product of God. He carried you in his heart. And you were born again of incorruptible seed. And he formed, he carried, just think how long God the Father carried you in the heart. If God goes from everlasting to everlasting, 
Well, that's outside of our little time box, isn't it? And he carried you in his heart all of that time. Wow, you give mom's credit for nine months. But my father, I'm a product of my father more than I'm a product of my mother and my father. In the in natural sense, I'm a product of God. He carried me. He saw me. I'd like to see how beautiful I was in his mind's eye because I think we have distorted lenses. And with the way we see ourselves is not the way he sees ourselves, but that has to change because the image was marred, but the image has been restored through Christ. But I think we're going to get to the how-tos, how to restore that image. And what God's promising me is that I'm going to see some image changes in some of the most difficult areas in the church. Uh, one of them that's really been rising to the surface recently is sexual identity. I believe there's confusion in, your, in their sexual identity and God's gonna start putting his finger on it and bring healing into people's lives. Um, it's interesting that research for the gay community and research in scientific community basically cannot find a gene. <laughs> so it's as much faith to believe that you're gay or lesbian as it takes to believe as a Christian that it's sin. I mean, they're both faith-based, so to speak, right? It takes faith to believe because there's no proof, all right? But as believers, we believe that it's sin, but yet you still love the people that are in that identity. I don't know about you, but if somebody's committing adultery, I still love that person. But if they're in adultery, that's the issue that needs to be changed in their heart and in their life. And I believe that he's given us a promise that he's, we're gonna start seeing some supernatural healing. He's gonna start putting his finger on the root causes of these things. And there's a lot of confusion in identity. And I believe that God's going to reveal himself to us. And I, I think he's even given us some how-tos uh, to, to kind of start the process off. But I believe that there's, uh, there's false identities that's so covered with pride, we don't even see ourselves the way God sees ourselves. Uh, the world promotes self-esteem. You don't really need self-esteem. You need God-esteem. God-confidence trumps self-esteem. Self-esteem is a humanistic approach. And we use that word often. I need self-esteem. No, you don't really. You don't need to esteem self. You need to esteem God, and you will come into who you really are. All right? So, but there's people that still to this day feel like they're stupid. They're a failure. I don't belong, I'm unworthy, damaged goods, unlovable, unspiritual, and disqualified. And basically, I want to give, I want to give uh, 10 facets. I just said 10. There will be no subpoints. Don't get scared. There won't be 13 subpoints under point one. All right? Just 10 points, because I'm going to kind of get to this, and I want to pray it. All right? This, this was done one time in a Bible school, I think for like six weeks, but <laughs> I'm going to do it in one ser sermon. So, uh, and there we go. Uh, <laughs> all right. But this is the, the unfolding of a timely aspect of what God is speaking, and that is the Genesis face. There, therein lies a depth of revelation that I believe God is going to unfold to us at this time and in this season and wash away, cleanse literally purge all false identities. And here's the elements. I'm going to give you 10 elements of the Genesis face. First of all, I'm going to show you where it's at. Open your Bibles, if you haven't already, to James chapter 1, verses 22 to 25. I am absolutely and totally convinced God's going to wash away false identities. And he's going to have to really deal with pride and the will because I know that in pastoring all these years, I've seen where people will not take your advice because they think you're biased, prejudiced, da, 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 da. It gets kind of old after a while, but th if they cling to it. Um, just had a, an unsaved person that I felt led to work with as an unsaved person over a period of months and months and months. And they followed my advice until their old addictive pattern clicked back in and then they did what they've always done. They resorted back to addictive behavior and addictive relationships. And she showed me her engagement ring. And it just broke my heart because I will see the aftermath of that later on. But they always think they know better. 
They think you don't have all the facts. And it's really just grieved me all day yesterday and today. And you know, what do you do? He said, congratulations. You know, my heart's not in it because I see an accident going somewhere to happen. And I see it in the church too. And it's like, I'm just going to, I have to just move on because it's, it's nothing I can do about it. Only God can put his finger on it, and that's where my confidence lies, that God's going to, in his graciousness and his mercy and his goodness, he's going to start putting the finger on it. But the one thing that I've learned is you can't make anybody do anything. You cannot make anyone do anything. And they will always have an answer against even sound wisdom. So ultimately, we need a sovereign move of God to start putting his finger on things that are unhealthy. I've watched it over the years, and I'm seeing it now, and it really breaks my heart. Bad choices, very, very bad choices. So if you've got a false identity, let me at least give you the answer, because I can't help people that are locked into doing it their way, or they think they know better, you know? And it's not my jurisdiction, nor is it yours, is it? She's engaged, congratulations, that's your decision. But here's what I see that God wants to give to a believer. And that is, in James chapter 1, there is a solution here for all of us. It says, but be a doer of the word and not a hearer, deceiving yourselves. That means that word has to be absorbed and accomplished. Not just in the flesh, trying to live it out religiously. It's calling for an internal transformation, a nature change, a supernatural cha exchange, or a supernatural transaction. I don't care what word you use, but I am, I, I am weary of church as usual, having the right answers, but never doing anything constructive with it. The right answers, unless it produces from a derivative life, something that you receive from God, own it, absorb it, and become a partaker of that divine nature, you don't really can't be a doer of the word. Our whole ministry is based on being a hearer of the word and a doer of the word and everything in the middle on how, how to accomplish that doing. It's not just hearing and doing. It's hearing, absorbing, assimilating until you are a partaker of that divine nature, till Jesus himself, the living word, the word is yours. And out of that value system, you are living and allowing that person to live through your life. That's the transformation. That's the supernatural transaction. That's the supernatural exchange. That's the kind of change that must take place. So here's the, here's the elements, and I'm going to go through these kind of quickly because I want to pray because I'm believing I'm at an impasse right now. I'm, I, I'm stalled between, God, you're going to have to do something because I can't do anything more. There, this is, there are multitudes of people that need delivered from the confusion of their sexual identity. We've got the tools. We're willing to help. We've got people that are struggling with the identity of traumas saying that they have to live there the rest of their life. Wrong. I've worked with military people, and I've seen results. I've worked with Vietnam vets, so I know it'll work with Iraq, Afghanistan, anyone else. You do not have to live with that stuff if you're a believer. That stuff can be dealt with, and it's not that difficult. I don't care what psychiatrists or medical doctors do, because basically, a lot of them aren't Christian, and they're going to medicate you. I'm telling you, if the medication helps, bless God, it helps. But I'm telling you, why not pursue God for a better answer? Why not, instead of learning to cope, why not learn to change? And I believe that God's going to start removing uh, these identity uh, victim uh, areas and what have you. All right, so here's area number one. Number one of these 10 elements. This is element number one. This is the fact. We've got to start with the fact. The fact is, in Genesis 1:26, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Image pertains to the internal work of transformation. He made you a spirit being. When God made us, he spoke to himself. He literally, we're a derivative life. He spoke to himself, and when he spoke us into existence, it came out of his nature. We were born again of incorruptible seed through the word of God, right? All right, so he made us that way. 
then we know that the beauty of the garden and walking in that image and in that glory in, in a healthy identity was marred through sin. Sin damaged the image. Okay, that's element number two. Do you believe that? Sin damaged the image. But in element number two, we have another problem. The problem in element two is that you have the responsibility to choose an image. You have a choice. And I think a lot of people are making bad choices right now, to be honest. Um, they're choosing the way that they're comfortable with. And do you know what's sad about comfortable old ways, comfortable old patterns? Is they have a false security and a safety and a momentary thrill that makes you think that's good. When in reality, you're crippling people and you're destroying your own purpose in life. False identities do that. But like any other addiction, momentarily, it feels satisfying. But the end is there's no fruit. So you're created in the image of God, element number one. Element number two, because sin had, uh, has marred that image, is that Romans 1, 21 to 23 says that we are responsible to choose an image. And the way I choose uh, an image, from the day I got saved, it was Philippians 3.10, that I might know him, that I might progressively become more intimately acquainted with him and all the wonders of his personhood. So from the time I was a baby Christian, God taught me to walk in a real relationship with whatever attribute God was revealing to me through the scriptures. If he was the shepherd, I learned to walk with him as my shepherd. What it would be like on a day-to-day -day basis in the factory with Jesus as my shepherd. Until I had a no-so on the inside, at least a satisfactory no-so, that it was real. And every time he would reveal an aspect of his character, his nature, it was like, I, uh, this dates me, but it was like the old disco ball with all the mirrors. Remember the little mirrors? And it was like he would, it, only his is an infinite, faceted, beautiful, huge diamond disco bulb with innumerable facets. But every time one would turn, it would flash on the tablet of my heart through the face of Jesus Christ, a specific aspect of his character and his nature. And like, remember those old time Polaroid cameras where you pull the paper up and then you watch the film go, kind of develop progressively. First it was just a black piece of paper and then it, all right, that progressive revelation is what God does when he shines on your heart through the face of Jesus Christ. So we are a derivative life, and we were created in the image of God. When we were created, he spoke to himself and released of himself and created us. And God is love, but he needed an object to love, didn't he? And guess who he chose? Us. And in that choosing, he chose us. We have the opportunity through Christ to restore back to image. Actually, part of repentance is a change of clothes and a back into image. Now, earlier this year, God gave us three aspects as a church that he said, I am going to reveal myself. And he did it for weeks and months on end, and he's still doing it. Three aspects. Now, he's deal obviously dealing with me because... I get excited when he reveals one thing. I want to absorb that one thing till I own it. But this year, he said, I'm revealing myself out of Isaiah 43 as the warrior. And I saw the mighty man rise through and break through with a shout. And what he broke through looked like a slimy spaghetti net. And that slimy spaghetti net that he broke through with a shout, with, his, with a smile on his face, but a Victoria, like a victorious champion, he just broke through. And it was like that breaking through, that ugly spaghetti stuff was soul ties, was dysfunctions, was agendas. Some of those things don't even look bad in themselves because they're not sinful in and of themselves, but they are a trap and a net to keep you from the freedom and being returned to the image of being who you are. So that was the first thing that God sh shared. Let me, let me read before we get too far into this. Um, 
Let me read all of James chapter 1. It says, be a doer of the word and not only a hearer, deceiving yourself. What we want to deal with this morning is the deception. The deceptions of false identities. The deception of personalities that aren't, didn't come from God. You, people put them on you or you put them on yourself. And if anyone is a hearer and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. If any man is a hearer but not a doer. Now remember, my concept of doing is not hear and then religiously do. My concept is you hear, you absorb, you own, you transform, then out of that abundance you minister because you own it. You minister out of the substance, out of the abundance of the heart. If it's not out of the abundance of the heart, you're just giving information. All right? But here's what it says. It says, but if you're a hearer and not a doer, you're like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. And I love that because I used to read that as fleshly face, carnal face. But that's not what that natural is. That natural is a man that looks at his Genesis face as in a mirror. When you look at your Genesis face, you're looking at the face of your birth. As a believer, when you look into, into the mirror of the word, you're supposed to be looking to God, for, to him to reveal himself and to reflect that upon your heart. That's the only way you truly see yourself. You don't see yourself until you see God. When you truly see God, you see yourself, good or bad. You see yourself the way he sees you. That's where transformation comes. That's where life change comes. When you look into the natural Genesis face, the face of your birth, that means that God basically is saying, when you look into the face of your birth, you're looking into the mirror of the word, you sink into him as being clothed. And then when he guards your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus, you're seeing yourself in the mirror of the word. When you're reading the word, you're not reading for information. You're reading the word to meet the author. When you meet the author in his presence, there is transformation and there's glory. So when you, but what glory are you manifesting to? What are you absorbing? What change is taking place? Depending on the scripture that you, the specificity of that scripture is basically the attribute or the person or the part of God that he wants to impart to you. And so when you get a scripture that's quickened to you and you get excited about a verse of scripture, don't just go, oh, that's exciting, and then run up and share it somebody. That can feel good, but that's nothing compared to looking into that word until you see him, you see his heart, and know that that's a portion of himself that he wants to give to you to be a partaker of that divine nature. He wants you to assimilate, absorb it and soak in it until that becomes your value system. When that becomes your value system, your value system is not ink on a page. Your value system is written on the tablet of your heart and it's God himself. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. We miss that. We look, we look to doctrine and lose sight of Jesus in the doctrine. Jesus and his word are one. All right? So it says when um, you, if anyone is a hearer and not a doer, and remember, everything happens in between hearing and doing that is significant. It's called intimacy and real relationship. If you're afraid of intimacy and real relationship, then you're probably not doing that middle part. You're just repeat after me stuff you learned. Right? But if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, you're like a man that observes your natural face in a mirror. You're looking at the face of your birth and instead of staying there in that image, you get up in your head and you start figuring things out for yourself. You start taking matters into your own hands and you're going to start doing the way you've always done your entire life. That lady that showed me her ring, I don't quite feel the grief that I felt when I started talking about it, but it was like I knew it was a divine appointment and I knew that God wanted me to continually say, you know, I see a lot of red flags, you ought to let it go. Damn. She listened for a while, backed off a little bit, but see the thing in the inside that needs change 
comes back like a rubber band because guess what? No matter how bad it is, there's a certain safety or security. Some people need the safety and the security of a relationship, even a bad relationship, even if they know better and they're not, they're not free enough to do it. And the funny thing is, is I know enough history to know what their prior life was like they're going to have the same thing. The same thing is going to happen again and again. Do you know that uh, children that were raised in an alcoholic family have a tendency to be attracted to people that drink too much? And then everybody wants, they say, well, they should know better up here. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't matter about knowing better up here. It's talking about a spiritual dynamic that needs to be changed and transformed. And I believe God's promised us he's going to set people free from this stuff. I've basically seen so much over the years that it's just like, why do I even bother sometimes? It's like, they're going to do what they want to do anyway. So I'm just going to hold out for the supernatural hand of God to start putting his finger on people because I give up. I give up with advice. I give up. I'm tired. I get weary of people. They always have an argument and they always act like they're smarter or they know better. And so it's just like, suit yourself, you know. But someday you're going to stand before the Lord and say, you know, there were some people that told me maybe I ought to be careful. But I didn't listen because I knew better. I knew better. Well, that brings us to the next point. The next point is the three areas that God um, revealed to us, by the way. I want to get this before I get to the next point. There's 10 points, and I'm on one. We're doing real well. All right. We're created in the image of God. The image was marred, correct? But the three aspects that God said this year that he was raising up for us as a church to get intimately acquainted with for internal transformation was the warrior that's going to break agenda, soul ties, codependency, uh, addictions, alcohol, and sexual identity problems for whosoever will. And all dysfunction, stupid, failure, don't belong, unworthy, damaged goods, unlovable, unspiritual, disqualified. He's taking an opportunity right now to set you free from that, but you can stay in it the rest of your life. And some people feel secure in staying in it the rest of their life. It's almost like I've got an excuse. It's always other people and circumstances, and never me, that needs to change. And so God says, I'm revealing myself this year to Kingdom Life Church, Full Stature Ministries, as the warrior who's rising up out of Isaiah with a shout, breaking free from that slimy spaghetti and that's all it is to Jesus. He basically, that stuff's nothing. He's already won the battle. He's revealing himself to us that if we're a partaker, we can break through that net of agendas, dysfunctions, sin, good things that we're trapped by. The second area is Adonai. He's saying, many, many people have served me for many, many years, but I'm going to begin putting my finger on their hearts because they have me as their savior, but I am not Lord of their life. And I'm going to begin to reveal myself to them as Adonai. You can't serve two masters. You can say Jesus is your savior, but then you pretty much are in control and do things the way you want as you see fit. There's going to have to be an abandonment to his lordship in a fresh and a new way. The third area is I'm your sanctifier. I'm going to come and I'm going to separate huge portions of your life away from me. But when I come in, I'm going to expect you to get out of the way. I want to be Lord of your life, and I want those portions for belonging to me. I want to be Lord in those areas, and I will sanctify them. And I believe that there's a measure of grace coming for, for it's the efficacy of the Holy Spirit that sanctifies, but he's going to teach us how to do it more completely. All right. Element number one is I'm created in the image of God. The image was marred. The image was restored through Christ. Element number two. God basically has put it upon us to choose an image. Write that down. Element number two. It's my responsibility to choose an image. Romans 1, 21 to 23 says, Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful. Here's what happens. They became futile in their thoughts, probably thought they knew better, and their foolish hearts were dark, and professing to be wise, they became fools. They changed the glory of the incorruptible 
the incorruptible God, they changed the glory into an image made like corruptible man. What am I saying? I'm saying that they came and they had the ability to see God. But the glory, when it's up here, is basically you're seeing God and you're seeing through God. When you get back into your head, you exchange that glory for, an in, for a corruptible view of the world and world systems. You enter into actually an area that's under the control of the prince of the power of the air. Even though you think you're doing what you want to do. So to choose an image, it says, professing to be wise, they became fools and they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image that's made by corruptible man. Tell me, if you feel like you're stupid, you feel like you're a failure, you're damaged goods, you're unlovable, you're unspiritual, you're not sure whether you're a male or female. You're not sure whether you like male or female. Do you think there is something that God is confused about? Or do you think there's some confusion in who you think you are? Well, God says basically choose the image. I don't know about you, but I would choose the image he made. If a wise person went to get the answers to things... If I wanted the answer to how was I made, I would go to the creator, not another created thing, and ask their opinion. <laughs> if you want to know the purpose of a thing, never ask the thing. They will be confused. The third element is... You shall have no other gods before me. God is very clear in the scripture, I will not have a graven image. What's a graven image? Anything that you project in preference to God himself. Anything that you see yourself as other than the way God made you. So basically, you shall have no other gods. You shall not make for yourself a graven carved image or any likeness that is in heaven or on earth. No matter how creative you are. When I used to deal with people on a one-on-one -on -one basis, I used to find out that cutting through the pride, they, they, most people with a, a pride identity, <laughs> which is, by the way, pride is rooted in Satan. Humility is rooted in God. So it's, to me, it was very simple, but guess what they used to say? I am a complicated person. And that's about usually when to get the pride viewed properly, it'd say, no, you're not complicated at all. It's quite simple. Roots are simple. Branches are complicated. But I'm not interested in the branches. I'm interested in the root. If you're rooted in Satan, you're rooted in pride. If you're rooted in humility, you're rooted in God. Roots are simple. Flower tops and branches, that's complicated. I'm not looking at the complicated. I'm looking at the source. If you go to the source, you begin to say, I, that image did not come from God. That image came from a wrong source. Why am I living in it? Why am I tolerant of it? So, no matter how God reveals himself, at any given time, you're presented with a choice. So it is our choice, and God doesn't want a graven image. 2 Corinthians 4, the fourth element. The fourth element is even if our gospel is veiled, doesn't veil usually represent the flesh hidden from our knower? Even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest, now here's the solution, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, oh, wrong chapter, 2 Corinthians 3, um, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So the solution is the image of God can shine on your heart. He doesn't shine on your head. He shines on the heart. 
And if this is going to cooperate with this, you have to go with what shines on the heart has to influence the head. Next time God gives you a scripture, you ba I basically drop down with that scripture and yield to it till I meet him. It's a living word that I want. I don't need dead letter. I don't need just word studies. I need him. And if he's going to impart, he only imparts one way, spirit to spirit. So if my spirit is where I meet him, then I'm going to drop down and get into his presence and meet him and see myself in the mirror of the word. All right? So Christ is the image of God. If it's been blinded, it's keeping Christ the image from shining on them. Who can blind the mind? Can the enemy blind the mind? Sometimes light has come into this world, but people love darkness. Why? Because their deeds were evil. And for believers, I think, because they like their dysfunction. They like the false image. It's been giving them an excuse. So the fourth element is that Christ is the image of God. It can be blinded. The fifth element is the express image is also the voice of the Father. So instead of always listening for a voice, the voice of the Father is basically found as Jesus, the person who is the express image image of the invisible God. Yes, but the express image is the voice of the Father. Now, Hebrews chapter 1. I can't read my own numbers. Is that where it's at? <laughs> Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. God, who at various times, talking Old Testament, um, at various times and in various ways, spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets. Do you agree? That was one of the ways he spoke. But he has in these last days spoken to us by his son. And when he speaks to us by his son, one of the first things the Lord taught me about for image change is it's not just the words that Jesus spoke. It was the words that he spoke. It was the life that he lived. It was the death that he died. It was the embodiment of his entire nature of obedience. And that that spoke. His life speaks. His nature speaks. His life and his death spoke volumes, and he spoke words. But they were synonymous. They were all, all one. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. The express image is the voice of the Father. The sixth element is the express image reveals the Father. And this one you've heard time and time again. When Jesus said to Peter, have I been with you so long that you've not known me? Oh no, Philip. Uh, he said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show me the Father? If you've seen me, he, he didn't want just words. He said, look at me, the life that I live, the things, that, the death that I'm dying, the the." the the words that I speak, the things that I do, I am the expression of the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen him. The highest form of communication is basically being an expression. Not words, an expression, a life message. A life message is the highest form of communication. It speaks. His life spoke. So much so that he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You've seen the invisible God because I am the express image of that invisible God. And if you've seen me, you've seen the expression because my nature and his nature are one. It's, it's, it's not like the elder brother and the father in the story of the prodigal. It's not like that. The elder brother was religiously dutiful, but he didn't share the father's heart even remotely, did he? When the prodigal come back, the father rejoiced, ran, hugged, laughed, kissed, put a ring on his finger, God's told me that you can do that in unconditional love, but then there comes a time to where they still have the right to go back to the pig pen and wallow in their old ways. So I used to think that was the cure-all all the time. Just give unconditional love to somebody, and that will break them out of the old dysfunctional routines. No. 
They never break out of a dysfunctional routine until God puts the finger on their heart and says, it's time for you to do it. And when you do it, when you do it, you're free. And until you do it, you're not free. Jennifer always says, through the years, she said, you're always so patient. But God's putting right now, I just kind of said, no, I have to let it go. Some people are just not going to change. And if they do, great. But I'm going to move on to hungry people that are looking to change. And you should be doing the same thing. The old patterns just don't, they have so much strength in them that only them and God can turn it around. Your counsel and your advice isn't going to do it. And you can love them till the end of the world and it still won't turn them around. They will still go back until that false identity has had the finger of God put their finger on it and remove it. So the sixth element is the express image not only reveals the Father, he who has seen me has revealed the Father, but it speaks, right? It speaks volumes. The seventh element. I, I still see in my mind's eye, I still see the lady showing me her engagement ring. She's going to go back to exactly the same thing that she spent maybe 18, 19 years of misery on. She's doing the same thing again. And then part of me goes, God, why did you even send me there? Why, 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 I know it was a divine appointment. Know, but why, why do you even have me do these things? Because there's multitudes that don't listen. Well, maybe after it's too late, they say, oh, you were right. But uh, that's not a lot of consolation for me. The seventh element is recognizing that we're a derivative life that we were born again of incorruptible seed. How many of you remember the messages on clothing? That God's saying, what I'm taking you now is to have you further clothed. That you're going to put on more incorruption. You're going to put on more immortality until that day when we put, we're fully clothed. There is a day where we're fully clothed. You will need a new body. All right. But until then, we're supposed to be clothed and further clothed in the days ahead. The express image reveals the Father. That's the sixth element. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The seventh element is, guess what? You were born again with that same seed. Do you realize that a seed, even if it's just a seed, has the potential to be a little oak tree? It has the potential to be an oak tree, even if it's just an acorn. It still has the potential is in it. But potential means you haven't done it yet. And potential means that that's wonderful. I see a lot of people with potential, but until they do something with that potential, until they start taking, becoming a little more of a risk taker than a caretaker, it's not going to happen. God is our Father, and He looks at us through Jesus Christ. So that means that when you drop down into the presence of God, He rises up. And if he rises up, you begin to look at yourself through the face of Jesus Christ, but he's seeing you through Jesus, right? But what if you're, you don't want to continue in the mirror of the word? You want to drop back down and look around, peek around, go back to your old poor me. But when you basically are dropped down and covered as the new creation and you see yourself as that which was born again of incorruptible seed, you actually say, I believe what God has said. I'm walking in that belief system of I am what I am by the grace of God. Then basically God sees you the proper way and you see yourself in the reflection. So that seventh element is that if we were not born again of corruptible seed, but rather incorruptible seed, then we should have an incorruptible future and we should be further clothed with incorruption, right? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The eighth element, to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of the Son. As we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. That's the godly pursuit. We've, as we born 
the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. And that's basically, we're going to put off the old and put on the new. And you know all about that. Put off the old image and put on the new image, but the process in between is everything we teach. Putting off the old, putting on the new. Instead of just quoting it, which really doesn't get far. It's basically saying, what is the internal process to put off the old, put on the new? Philippians 3.10, for my determined purpose is to know him. The main point here is it's a progressive revelation and that God wants to progress in the revelation, but there has to be some removal of the old garments for the progressive revelation to take. You have to choose the image. And when you choose the image, you discard the old. How do you, how do you put off? Remember, we, had, we even used it to make it simple, spiritually, instead of just conceptual. You open your heart, not this. O, F, F, O, F, F, open. By the way, this is where your will is, not here. Open, receive forgiveness and repentance. F, forgive, open, ask Jesus to come in, cleanse me of my sin. Peace, supernatural transaction, a supernatural exchange, peace, O, F, F. I open my heart, even if you didn't know what you did, this is how you got saved. O-F-F, you opened your heart whether you even knew where your heart was. You did it right. Wonderful. You opened your heart. You yielded your will. You invited the saving grace to come in. Cleanse you of your sin. That means you're clean. And you have peace with God. That peace is a supernatural exchange. You put off. And by the way, put off the old. Put on Anywhere in your New Testament that says put on is the Greek word enduo, which means to sink into as being clothed. The peace of God guards your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. You can do all kinds of stuff up here. It ain't going to work. You sink into God and he rises up. In the Hebrew, be still and know that I am God. That's basically in the Hebrew, it's be still, is to sink into as being clothed, and God will rise up in you and affect your life. It's down up. These are, this is so simple, this can be taught to little children, but 40-year old Christians, I mean Christians in the faith 40 years, need re-educated because they've got the whole thing upside down. They're trying to start here and push it down when it doesn't work that way. Psychology tries to do it that way, and it doesn't work. It's hard to get those emotions under the control of thoughts, isn't it? I'm picking on Jennifer because she was a school psychologist. So God's smarter. She said, I, hung, I put it all up on the shelf. But the eighth element is that God wants you to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Son. So put off, put on. You've got to open receive forgiveness and walk in peace whenever peace is ruling god is ruling and if god's ruling you're in image isn't that nice to know there's a shortcut here it's not a shortcut but if you have peace in here like oh my god how am i doing what he's going to say there's 10 elements i don't have time for 10 elements i got to go to work and i'm stressed out all right if you've got peace here the image is there you're in image because peace guards your heart and your mind. It also means he's ruling. If he's ruling, you're at least an image. Doesn't mean you're complete or mature. It simply means you're walking in the light that you have. Thank God for that. At least you're walking in the light that you have. All right? And when you do put on the new image, the process in between is being renewed in the spirit of your mind. And we have to repeat this to believers because you've been too indoctrinated by psychology. And that is that the renewal of the mind in the Hebrew context is never just your thoughts. Never, never, never. It's mindset. The mindset for the Hebrew is everything's connected, nothing's missing. Your mindset means mind, will, and emotions all have to be impacted to facilitate change. You don't just change your mind. You can do that. But in reality, here's the shocker for the church. 
emocognition, emovolition. Whether you believe it or not, science has already proved this, and the Bible validates it, but our old teachings haven't caught up yet. And that is the emotions control your thinking and the emotions control your choices. And the church is taught to be what to do, right? How to think and how to act. Oh, emotions, uh, you just ignore those things because they just get you in trouble. Can't live by your emotions, you know. Isn't that sad? When God is an emotional God, he says, I made the fruit of the Spirit to flow through your emotions. I didn't want you, I got the joy of the Lord by faith. I'm a man of faith. I got the joy of the Lord. That's really great. I just love it. Feel good. Yeah. I don't know what good means, but I saw it on the bulletin board in the Sunday school. A little cornucopia with oranges and apples and everything. They told me it was the fruit of the Spirit. Yeah. I believe that. <laughs> All right. I want experience, don't you? So Philippians 3.10 is my determined purpose. God says basically the ninth element and here's what I believe he's going to do in the days ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I have 11 elements. Oh my goodness. I'm going to have to go five minutes over. I thought I had 10. All right. The ninth element is the way this is manifesting. For whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Let's look at the, 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 the big picture. The big picture is that from eternity past, God the Father sent his son that he would bring forth many sons unto glory. You know, let's look at the big picture. That's where we're going. That should be your primary understanding of what's going on. It's not just to get you saved. It's to bring many sons unto glory and for you to be reproducers and reproduce reproducers. And here's the stages that it goes into. The Christ is the firstborn of the, uh, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creations, and that we might be the firstborn among many brethren, Romans 8, 29. Basically what God is saying is that I want you to reproduce according to that kind, and it's a progressive revelation. We're being restored in the image. The tenth element is the man in the mirror, and this is where we started. The man in the mirror. Who is the man in the mirror? Who's the woman in the mirror? The man in the mirror is, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask. God gives liberally without reproach and it will be given to him. Let him ask in faith without doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose he will receive anything for the Lord. For he is a double-minded man. And when God revealed to me that when a man looks into and sees his natural face as in a mirror, that natural face is your Genesis face. It's the derivative life. It's the face of the new birth. It's the faith. Uh, the face of the new creation, your Genesis face, the face of your birth. I began to look at this one and says, but don't let that man who is double-minded well, you know, the scripture says the single eye, that body's full of light. But another image would be a graven image. So a double-minded man is looking at a duality, which is idolatry. A double-minded man, and this is what God laid on my heart, is two-souled, two-minded, or two-faced. The two-faced part hit me hard. Two-faced, two-minded, two-souled. That means you can know better, but you oscillate between the two. And that's what I believe God's going to start fixing. People that are struggling in their sexual identity, that's not being dealt with in the church, God's going to begin to put his finger on that area and say, you're going to get, restore you back to the image you were created. God's going to start to restore the people who are codependent, and he's going to start revealing your codependency and says, you know what, that's a false image, that's idolatry, that's a graven image. You need to get free from that. He's going to start putting his finger on, on all of those things that you've said about yourself. I'm a failure, I'm stupid, I'm no good, I'm unworthy. And he's going to start saying, you can stay like that, and you can stay in your dysfunction and just like the dog going back to its vomit, you can go back to it or you can present it to God and let him shine his light on it because the man in the mirror is basically, if you're two-minded, two-souled, two-faced, it's time to get singular, isn't it? It's time to see yourself the way God sees you and it's a choice. 
And so God basically says that we're going to cast down arguments, high things that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and every thought bring it captive to the obedience of God, 2 Corinthians 10. We have to destroy the false image, but nobody can do that for you because it requires your will. You have to want to. And what do we say about all dysfunctions? God never made anybody dysfunctional. You did that all by yourself. (laughs) It gets comfortable. And the part that I saw is the genuine is not as as attractive as the dysfunction. Until you're willing to take that to the cross and make that middle stage of uncomfortableness. I'm doing this. I'm getting up. I'm dusting myself off and I'm going to do what's right regardless of how it feels. Because your addiction will always feel better momentarily. Even if it's not attractive, I'm going to do what's right. And I'm not going to teach on that farther because we're running over time, but Deuteronomy 13 get, lays out some principles on how to deal with that. But lastly, God basically wants us to return to that Genesis face, to seek into him and let the Father see Jesus in us. While we have peace down here, we've got Christ in here. You sink into him being clothed. You're walking in the new creation identity. So let's just pray, and those are watching by Ustream. Father, we pray right now that for those that are confused in their identity, things that you know that you're a derivative life and that God didn't make it for you, there's sexual confusion and sexual identity confusion, then we're just going to say, I'm going to go to the source of my creator, not to man. I'm not going to man for my answers. I'm going to God for my answers. And I'm going to ask God for all of my dysfunctions now is the time to get rid of them. Do I want to keep them just because I'm used to them, just because I'm comfortable with them? Or is this a day of transition and change? Is this a day when God's going to put his finger on the areas of my life and literally turn them around and that I'm willing to do whatever it takes to turn it around, which means it's not all going to be instant. There are multitudes that I've dealt with around the country that basically are struggling with the fact that they might, in their head, think that they swing both ways. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. They think they swing both ways. They, they're confused in their sexual identity even. And I'm sitting there thinking, that, that's an unnecessary torment. There's a way to remedy that through prayer. There's a way to remedy that. Don't live with that. And the same with any other addictive behavior. Now is the acceptable time. Today is the day of salvation. So, Father, we just pray that right now I receive forgiveness. In very simple terms, I receive forgiveness for Christ the forgiver on the inside of me and my spirit. I am welcoming forgiveness for tolerating any other image other than the one that God sees me as. I receive forgiveness for tolerating. It's coming down right now. I receive forgiveness for any other image. When you receive forgiveness, you're in the place of power. And the place of power, then you can renounce strongholds. You can't renounce a stronghold till you're in the place of power. And through repentance and forgiveness, you're in the place of power. When you have peace inside, he's ruling. When he's ruling, you've got authority to renounce that lie that that is not who I am. I am not inferior. I am not a failure. I can fail, but I'm not, it's not my identity to be a failure. I am, I am not ashamed of me. I am not a shameful person. I can be ashamed of an action, but I am not ashamed of me. I will not wear that. That's a graven image. I renounce that graven image, and I present it to Christ within, and I let him carry it away. He takes my pain, and he takes my sorrow, and there are supernatural exchanges that he and he alone is the only one that can touch that and carry it away in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.